I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample-tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by the writer, director, producer, star of reality show, Adam Rifkin. Hello. You know him from such classic films as The Chase, Detroit Rock City. I mean, you've been working all over the place in Hollywood for years now. And the thing that I want to start out talking about with reality show is, of course, the concept of reality. I mean, this is something that you could see interest of yours dating back to the chase. What is it about reality or the perception of reality that is such an engaging idea to you? Well, I think I'm fascinated by voyeurism. I think I always have been. I'm a voyeur, but I think we're all voyeurs. Oh, yeah, I think. Uh, and people think of voyeur, the term voyeur, as being some creepy peeping Tom looking into a window. It's not the case. If you enjoy a movie, you're being a voyeur. You're looking in on these people's experience, this story that they're, that's unfolding. And now, especially with new media and new technology, voyeurism has exploded beyond anything anybody could have imagined. It's, you know, with, with Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and people put themselves voluntarily under surveillance 24 hours a day and we all just look in on everybody else's business. I find that interesting. I mean, what do you point do you think it changed? I mean, it's you're definitely right with like Facebook, Twitter and all that stuff. Was it like, I mean, for me it seems I guess maybe around the time of Survivor where it really changed where people got to the, the notion of like reality being a career. Like before, you know, like Facebook and all that stuff people do and you know, if you're famous or something, people might follow you. But, you know, Survivor and then all the re Real Housewives of blah, 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 the Kardashian shit. Well, that all, that all exploded at the same time that the internet was exploding. You know what I mean? This all, this all kind of, all the planets kind of aligned together at the same time where th this, this, you know, everybody has always wanted to be famous. You know, the people who want to be famous. Uh, but now people can make themselves famous on a global scale themselves. I, you know, people, I remember it was all sort of coming into focus as well when people were becoming, were turning themselves into MySpace stars. Oh, yeah, Tequila Tequila, you know? was first thing I was Perfect example, right? So suddenly people realized, I can be famous, I can do it myself, I can create a, a profile for myself that I can project to the world and it can make me famous and I don't have to necessarily do anything other than professionally pursue fame. Yeah. And, uh, and so that all happened at the same time as the internet gave us the opportunity and the, and the tools with which to do it, and reality shows became more and more successful. It just all sort of built and built and built on itself, and, and YouTube, and, and uh, the ability to people, for people to, to broadcast their, you know, their comings and goings to a global audience. You know, I, I explored the idea of surveillance and being surveyed and, and uh, and this whole concept with a movie I made called Look, which was a drama that was entirely shot with surveillance cameras. And, and, the, and it was multiple stories interweave, interweaving, uh, but uh, all as though it were uh, cold surveillance footage. I then did Look as a series for Showtime. Uh, Big Brother was sort of the theme of Look the movie. Big Brother and Little Brother became the, the theme of the TV show because I introduced webcams and phone cams and, and Twitter and Facebook. And now, um, with reality show, because I had had so, such an interesting experience exploring um, Big Brother and Little Brother, I thought to myself, well, what's another angle on, on voyeurism and surveillance? Uh, one thing I didn't explore with Look was, what if somebody is being intentionally put under surveillance? You know, we're all living in front of cameras right. every day, but what would be the reason that somebody could be being put under intensive surveillance? And I started to think, well, you know, somebody could be under surveillance because of the government, you know, some sort of spy maybe, you know, all very good stuff potentially, but I felt that I'd seen it before. I, but what I hadn't seen is what if somebody was put under surveillance without their knowledge to be the stars of a reality show? And that's where the idea came from for reality show. Yeah, I mean, I think you sort of run several different lines with the movie. I mean, there's the the discussion of sort of fame itself but i mean it touches upon like you know there are shades of truman show there obviously sure, with, sure. you know and it, the thing is like it's sort of like taking truman show and putting it in a more tangible environment 
like, and Grand Truman Show is a much more sort of controlled story or whatever. But, I mean, this is what it would be like in the real world if someone were like, fuck it, I want to make a Truman Show. Like, right. this is what that experience is like. Stepping back one second, though, you talk about Look being a series. Yeah. From what I understand, is is reality show a series, too? Yes. Because, it's, it's, like, I was looking initially on IMDb, and I was like, wait, wait, this says it's a series. That can't be right. It's true. What happened was the original idea for reality show was a movie. Okay. But I had just done Look, the series for Showtime, mm. and it was very successful for them. And so we started talking about, well, maybe reality show could work as a series. So we, we didn't do it as a movie. We told the idea to our partners at Showtime. They liked it. And so we made it as a series for Showtime. When we were finished with the series, once I had delivered all the episodes, I said to my producing partners on it, I said, you know, the original idea for this was always a movie, and I still think there's a movie in here. Mm. Um, the series is one experience, and the series is very much more a comedy than the movie. Yeah, we can, we'll get into that yeah. in a little bit. But, um, but I said, if we cull it all down, if we, if we just sort of boil it all down, deduce it all down to its core story, I think that core story could be a really compelling 90-minute movie. So um, the editor, Rita K. Sanders, and myself took it upon ourselves. And there was no budget to make a movie mm -hmm. version of it because we spent it all on the TV show. Sure. But we just took it upon ourselves to cut it down into a movie. And it worked. And we, oh, we, thought it, we thought, you know what, this is the original idea. The, it, the original idea has survived the, the whole m television series experience and, and, and it has emerged out the other side as the movie that I had always envisioned in the first place. That's, that's really interesting because that was the whole problem with Mulholland Drive, uh -huh. is that was initially supposed to be a, a series, right, but right. like they couldn't do that, so right. they ended up making a film. Right, right. But yeah, I, d I never felt like it was hashed together like it never felt like I was like whoa whoa this is a jarring move in this cool. film. it felt it felt very natural thank you thank you you bring up the notion of the comedy versus drama and you know I'll, I'll be honest going into this film I very much was expecting comedy given uh -huh. your background like I love the chase uh -huh. Trey Rock Chase is a very funny film these are very entertaining movies but this film and I don't know if it was you're really trying to be like honest, like these are the effects of like fucking with reality. Um, but the second half of that film, I mean, I don't know how to describe it other than sort of like haunting. Like it is really actually kind Thank of you. stuck with me. Oh, because great. The, like when everything, I don't know if it's you want to describe as like dominoes start to fall in order, it really gets pretty disturbing. Thank like, you very much. Is that something that you worried about doing? Was it something that you just felt like had to be done because it seems like one of those things that you know people like myself like I I mean I was I enjoy even if a movie if, as long as it makes an impression on me sure. like, I think that's a good thing about a movie but some people might um, it, it could be a lot to take in for some people you know? sure it's, it's a, it is an intense I don't know last 30 minutes 20 minutes whatever that last portion sure. is. is that something that you worried about or you're just like you know, let the chips fall where they may. I was I was worried about not going far enough. Really? Yeah, I wanted to make sure that it went for the throat. Uh, and because <laughs> uh, what I wanted to do, uh, listen, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say I don't watch reality television. We've it's all seen it. It's impossible to avoid. It's impossible to avoid. It's part of the culture. Does it, you know, does, does a lot of it kill brain cells? Of course. That said, True story, we watched a lot of Honey Boo Boo in the editing room while we were cutting this. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of obvious pot shots that could be taken at reality television. Sure. It's such an easy target. We all know it's fake, you know what I mean? But I just find it fascinating, this, this thirst that people have for being famous at any cost. And, and also too, the, you know, the technology is amoral. And it's our sense of morality that we, we inject into it that makes an experience like what happens in a reality show or in real reality television or the internet or whatever. It's, it's the morality that we inject into it that, that gives it either, that makes it either immoral or moral. You know, so, because the technology just exists. So a character like the character I play, because I play, as you know, the producer who has this family under surveillance and when they're too boring, he pushes it and pushes it and pushes it to make it more interesting, and it just goes dark, it yeah. goes wrong. And so, but to him, 
to him, it's, it's all about making this show a success. And he believes without any, you know, sort of morality obstructing his ability to do his job as effectively as possible, he believes that if, it, if they can just get this show on the air and it's a success, that that fame that these people will experience will heal all wounds no matter how bad it gets. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you bring up your character, the producer, because, I, I mean, I think I have, I don't mean, maybe it's not a unique sort of perspective of him. Like, I, th I don't necessarily just look at him and think villain. Uh -huh. I think, I mean, he definitely goes into the whole thing with somewhat noble intentions. Sure. Like he just wants it to be reality. He wants, yeah. he wants it to be true reality. Right. And it feels like that working with the executives at the network yeah. kind of wear him down. And by the end, I mean, I don't know if you want to say who he is just naturally comes out most at the end sure. or that it's just the whole process of doing this that has sort of like grinded him down. But I, I, I don't think like at least in the first half of the thing that I looked at him I was like, this is just like a maniacal sure. manipulator sure. who wants to like succeed at any cost sure. like he like he seems like he thinks just it itself will be a success absolutely and he rationalizes that you know if we just influence just a little bit here we're not we're not contriving what's how their reactions are going to uh, be we're just going to put a little obstacle in their way and whatever they however they react to it, that's real. That, that will be drama, and it'll make the show more interesting. And then that hopefully will kickstart a much more interesting experience for the, for the viewer. But he has to keep pushing it and pushing yeah. it. And the network pushes him to push it more. And, and you're right, it, it's, it's a slow burn. But like I was saying last night, it's the, it's the old sort of um, story that if you throw a frog in boiling water, it mm. will leap out of the water immediately. But if you put a frog in tepid water and slowly crank up the heat before right, it realizes yeah. it, it's boiling. So that's how I wanted the experience for the audience to be. I, I wanted it I to be- I think that's a fair description. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted it to be light. I wanted people to not necessarily see him as a villain off the bat, but kind of understand, all right, these people are a little boring. It is a little annoying. Let's see what happens if you inject a little bit of interesting into their lives and what happens. And, but then it, it goes too far. I mean, it's, it's sort of the thing about, you think about like the Truman Show again, you know, they sort of are similar in that they try and do these things to make it more interesting. Sure. But granted, that feels much more like at the end of the day, they want Truman to be a hero or whatever. Right. And in the case of reality show, you guys are just like, you want interesting stuff to come out of the family. And right. so it, the manipulation is, is much darker, you know, losing a job, you know, breaking a, a relationship, going sideways, that kind of stuff. I mean, I guess the whole thing really sort of comes down to like, you know, discussion of things like Big Brother, like manipulating people's lives. Because there, there are sort of two distinct things going on, like right. the documenting of people's lives and then the manipulating of people's right. lives. Correct. And I mean, do you look at this as sort of like a potential warning of like, this I, is where I think things are headed. I, like, I do feel that this is a, to a certain degree, a cautionary tale. Because I, I do feel that w what the character believes he's doing and, and how he rationalizes that it's okay to do it, I do believe that, that we are not that far from that existing somewhere at some network with some producer who thinks this actually could be a good idea and let's let's try it you know the the, the, the reality television pushes the envelope so far with what is you know potentially arguably inappropriate or appropriate behavior yeah. but it always yet we're always shocked when it goes a step farther than we thought it could possibly go i believe what happens in reality show could happen you know you, the movie the biggest inspiration for the movie was not the Truman Show. The biggest inspiration for me, as far as other movies go, was a movie called Network, mm, which was written yeah, by sure. Patty Chayefsky, directed by Sidney Lumet. Yeah. Classic, brilliant movie. And it basically, that movie was a prophecy. It predicted how, it predicted the, 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 the situation that we are in now with the media. At the time that movie was made, it, uh, that was like 76 yeah, or something. Yeah, 75, 76. And basically the idea for people who haven't seen it is is that the, the, this, this uh, failing network uh, is losing money. They need money and they need uh, a viewership any way they can get it. And so they have this crazy idea that the news department, which is always 
to operate independently and remain, you know, um, uh, fair and remain um, impartial and, 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 and yeah, they are going to have to be uh, answerable to creative for ratings. It's no longer about just objective news telling. Now it's about you need to you need to guarantee us ratings and how that affects the way the news is broadcast yeah. and what the new what news they they decide to to tell. And so at the time the movie came out, it was seen as an outrageous satire. Very successful movie, brilliant movie, but people thought that was nuts. Now it's so much worse in real life than that movie could have ever predicted. Yeah. So in, in reality show, I am convinced that if it hasn't happened already, somebody is thinking that a reality show with somebody being the star of this show without them knowing they're the star of a show is either happening or has at least been discussed. And that's, that's one of the things I want to ask you about. Did you actually look into the legality of it? Because that's one of the funny moments in the beginning. I was like, we looked into it. The most we could do was like a misdemeanor. Like. Yes, we did look into it. We looked into it quite extensively. And there are, there are a host of legal reasons why it would have been OK to a certain degree to do it and why oh, it would have been worth scary. the risk. For one, and you know, if you haven't seen the movie, this won't make as much sense, but Mickey Wagner, my character, would be liable for very little of what went on because it was all his people that did the breaking and entering and all his people, that, so they'd be the ones that would go to yeah, jail for things like that. I had noticed that like the first instance of me thinking that was when he's like, push the button, push the button <laughs> right. to pick the people. I was like, this feels very like he's trying right, to right. set him like a patsy kind of guy. Exactly. Yeah. So, the, listen, you can put, you can broadcast anything and there's a way to get around the legality of it. That's so scary. this is definitely something that I think could be in our future, for that, better or for worse. That's scary. But can I, tell, I just want to tell you this. Reality television, right, satisfies the same thing in us all. It, it goes back as far as people go back. It satisfies the same thing in us all that drew us to the Coliseum to watch Christians get torn apart by lions. And it's the same thing that drew us to watch witches burning at the stake, and it's the same thing that drew us to watching public hangings, and it's, you know, everybody loves a train wreck. People can't control it. It's just a part of human nature. So reality television is sort of the current version of going to the freak show, going yeah. to the gladiator match, and it's just something in us all needs to the see. primal. Yeah, this primal need to see that they're way worse off than me, and that makes me feel a little bit better about myself. Yeah. The other thing that's sort of something that I really love, I, I'm a huge 1984 fan. Me too, and absolutely. There's an element of that really very much in this film where, like, you know, it's not even so much that you're documenting this guy's life, but, like, it is, it is capturing everything about this life. You guys are everywhere. And, like, I think that's part of the funniest thing is, like, when you're having, I think, lunch with your ex-wife and you're documenting that, and she's like, <laughs> why is that guy there? Is this being filmed? Right, and so right, I'm like, right. oh, yeah, I film everything I do right. now. And the, the notion of just cameras being everywhere, capturing everything we do, like, you know, our lives being constantly under surveillance, was that something that you thought about when you're putting this together as sort of an influence because it really I mean the the notion of like our lives constantly being controlled is one of the things that's stuck with me about 1984 because that's such a terrifying idea without a doubt and that's and and I and I dealt with that in the movie and the TV show look and also in this I find that fascinating I find that terrifying there is no privacy anymore I mean there's nothing you can do I mean I guess you could leave your phone at home, you could, uh, and just start walking into the desert. But yeah, I mean, and eventually, there's probably you know, somebody in the desert with a phone. Probably, like, like everyone has a camera. There's no, there's no, there's just no privacy anymore. And so, um, and that, listen, I'm not saying that's good or bad. That just is reality. It is. It is, it is what so, it is. So, and and with and with this movie, one of the things that you know, as a subtle little thing that I, I touched on, but I'm glad you picked it up. You know, he, they, they know, the, the producers know not only everywhere they're going and everything they're doing because they're filming it, but they know every credit card, you know, receipt. Every time they've oh, used yeah. a credit card, they know where they used it, what they used it for, what, how much, what the, you know, they know. That it's, this is a really good time for stalkers in the world, unfortunately yeah. for everybody else, because um, you, you just have access to, you know, like, like you, can, you can hack into people's, Webcams, oh, yeah, cell phones, webcams. Yeah. You can hack into anything. You can you can watch into people's homes without them knowing it. Terrifying. I have a piece of tape over my laptop yeah, yeah, webcam. Yeah, I know definitely. Because people do that. Yeah. People do that. 
I mean, you bring up a good thing. I mean, obviously, you are a celebrity. Like, what is what was the element of that sort of like? I mean, do you really consciously think about these? I mean, obviously, you put that over your phone. But I mean, you know, everywhere you go, you know, there's probably people following you, looking at well, you, I, taking photos I, of you. I like, wouldn't. I, I, you, you flatter me. So, and I appreciate that, and uh, I, I will, I will accept the term celebrity as a, as a, as a compliment. So thank yeah, so you. That's what I mean. Thank you very You're much. You're recognized for your work. I, I, um, there, there are some, a few film geeks who occasionally will recognize me, and that is always appreciated, and I thank them for their support. No, it, no, but seriously, I don't have to worry about it, really. Luckily, like, I mean, listen, we live in a world where. Everybody, it's an issue with. I mean, almost every girl I know has been stalked, either by somebody who has a crush on them or by an ex or something. It's it's a scary world for everybody, you yeah. know. And so I can't even imagine what it must be like for a genuine superstar, like mm. you know, like uh, Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston. I mean, everywhere you go, everything you do. No wonder they're so guarded. You know, it it's easy to say when you're at home looking at them. God, that person's an, a, a jerk for the way they react, but. It must be very bombarding for the big stars, uh, you know, on a regular basis. If it's that bad for just about everybody else, you know. And in terms of like the film, I mean, obviously you are one of these stars. I mean, there are any number of people, I guess, you could argue as the star of the sure, film. Sure, sure. What is it like in terms of you wanting to act and direct and stuff? Is acting a passion for you, or is it something you feel like you feel like? you know how the thing needs to come, the performance needs to come out, and that's why you do it. What is it about that, sort I'll, of that crossing that line? I'll tell you exactly. My, my passion is writing, directing. That's okay. my passion. I do not consider myself an actor. Even though I do it, I don't pursue it as a, as a career. But like you said, there's a couple reasons why I'll do it, especially in a project like this. This project we're, is, uh, is we're moving fast, didn't have a lot of money, and the lead of the project had to be available to me at all times, uh. okay? I knew I would always be available to myself. If I'm there directing it, I knew I'd always be there to act in it, you know? Because in addition to shooting it conventionally, we also ran around very guerrilla style and shot a bunch of other stuff too, whenever Seems we needed in, to. In line with the film. As, as, you know, the, as the director, I put myself at the bottom of my list as far as casting choices. But out of necessity, a lot of the time, I have given myself a role that I think probably a professional actor might have done a better job with. But for, you know, for practical purposes, it, it, it works. And I'm not saying that I'm um, so bad in the project. Yeah, I think, I think I'm fine think in it. You, yeah, I think you're good. But I have a limited range. I think if I had to do a really serious role where I'd had to cry, and I mean, I don't think that, that I, you know. You might not do that. I might not be able to pull that one off. One of the interesting things about the film is sort of, you know, the notion of reality shows, which is kind of funny because you work in a medium where, you know, so much of television and all that stuff is watered down because they're giving those time slots to reality shows and stuff like Is there any sort of consciousness of that for you as somebody who's creating entertainment, you know, you're writing it, you're directing all this stuff, whereas reality shows, they're just like, let's get the latest Kim Kardashian, throw her in front of your camera, and then we're well, good to go. Well, it is, listen, I understand business-wise why they do it. Sure, yeah. It's, it's very cheap. inexpensive to yeah. produce, and it's very successful. So it's like the perfect combination for, for, for a network, you know? Um, is, would it be better if there were more really great, original, scripted shows being made? Absolutely. But you know what? The, the, the momentum it just takes things the direction that it takes things. The, to, you know, the tide is the tide, you know? Right. And so I, I wouldn't want to gripe about that as much as I'd want to find a creative challenge within it. So for me, instead of just being upset and angry that that was the case in the current climate, I thought, well, what if I make a movie and comment on it? And that's how reality show emerged. So in a way, what pissed me off about it gave me the opportunity to make this movie that I never otherwise would have thought of. So, you know, if they're coming to you with like, hey, Adam, we want you to do the Real Housewives of Portland, <laughs> you could try and find the creative challenge in that. There is totally a fun way to to skewer something like that. I could. I don't think I could 
do a reality show for real. Yeah. I don't think I could take it seriously. If I was going to do a reality show for real, it would have to be some sort of messed up or, or you know, satirical version of a reality show, you know? You know, obviously a lot of your past has been doing, uh, I guess, more narrative type films, you'd say, and now you're in sort of more of a... Uh, faux reality kind of yeah sort way. of docu style yeah, yeah. Is, do you have any intentions of going back to sort of narrative films oh yeah or yeah is this is just a really you know I the thing is I've been really lucky that I've gotten to do all different kinds of projects mm -hmm. you know Hollywood loves to be able to pigeonhole you yeah totally. and and they see you as the guy who does you know, you're the comedy guy. You do mid-range comedies with young up-and-coming comics, and we see you that way, and we will reward you by continually feeding you opportunities to do more of them. And in a way, it could be perceived as a career liability for me to want to do and have done a lot of different kinds of things. That said, I can't help myself. If I have an idea that I feel is a big idea, I have to pursue it. If I feel that an idea is a little idea, I have to pursue it. Funny idea, scary idea, drama, I just, I, I love telling stories. I want to tell all different kinds of stories. Like, for example, the next movie that I'm making is a just straight up drama. It's not faux, you know, docu style. Yeah, it's not yeah, reality yeah. style. It is is straight, you know, uh, narrative drama. And I'm, it's it's a passion project. I'm really excited about it. And it's a total departure from the last couple years that I, uh, of stuff I've been doing with the look and with the reality show. In terms of like the technology of it, obviously this takes advantage very much of like sort of the digital age of filmmaking. Is that something that interests you, or, or, or are you sort of like, I mean, is that just because of the topic? I mean, do you want to continue doing that? Or are you more of like a classical film person in general? I love film. Don't get me wrong. I love shooting with film. I love the look of film projected. But I am not um, one who wants to you know dig my heels in the sand and say I'm a purist and film is king and everything else is crap and the world's going to hell in a handbasket you know to me progress is progress things move in in the direction they move in you know people people railed against sound when it was new you know so the, they screamed that you know the sound ruins the, the the fact that film is an international language that that is you know that that is understood through faces and expressions and you don't need language it's the language of emotion and you know but then of course when sound kicked in everybody realized oh sound is great same with color same with every every new advancement you know well, that raises a good question though being sort of someone who's willing to adapt to market, does this mean that we're going to see a 3D movie coming from you sometime <laughs> soon, something like that? Let me put it to you this way. I have always loved 3D when it is done creatively and when it's done right. You know, I think 3D, here's, here's the problem, here's one of the problems that, that Hollywood has, okay? When there's something new and it's proven to be successful once or twice, suddenly that's what Hollywood thinks is everything. everything yeah. You know, it's like when CG was the new um, way to create creatures and effects, yeah. suddenly the, they would, the movie, certain movies would say, all right, well, we'll do every effect it's with CG. CG. Yeah. And so you get all these crappy looking effects rather than, okay, CG, Technology is one new tool in a box of already really cool tools that I can still use. Yeah, and for me, there's sort of two fundamental problems with 3D. Number one, the price. Until they make 3D films the exact same cost as yep, 2D films, yep. I think that's going to be a fundamental problem. Yep. And the second one is, I don't know if audiences fully understand what 3D really is supposed to bring. Like, right, I right. feel like audiences expect stuff to just like right. pop out and using it for things like depth, like Pixar does yeah. for a lot of their films. I, I think people come out and they're like, what the fuck's the point of that? Yeah, yeah. So I think until the audience understands the technology, it's going to yeah. be just sort of a problem. Uh, I mean, is there anything that you want to do that you haven't gotten to do? Like, I mean, obviously, I find, you know, if somebody comes to you and they're like, hey, uh, Adam, would you do Inception 2? We've got $150 million for you. I would say yes. <laughs> but, like, is there anything that you'd like to do that you haven't done yet? Because you said you like to do what you want to do. There's so many things that I like and that I want to do and that I haven't done yet. I have so many scripts I've written that I intend to still make. I have so many ideas that I haven't yet written. I have so many, I've read a lot of scripts that I haven't written that I would love to direct. I've read books that I would love to see made into movies. 
there's I, I have uh, so many things I want to do and so little time to do it in um, that yeah I, I am not at a, at a shortage for 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 what I want to do next one of the things that I appreciate with like reality show and I haven't seen look but it sounds very inter interesting given what you've described mm -hmm. as is what is your sort of perspective on you know working towards budgets and stuff for these projects. Obviously, you know, when you're connected to Showtime, that helps right. you get some money and they're happy with your work, that helps you going forward. But, I mean, film is a notoriously difficult thing to get the money to produce projects, right. as you've said. Um, is that part of the reason why you've liked doing stuff like reality show and look? Like, because well, they're, they're much more streamlined in terms of budget. Absolutely. Like well, that. to me, you know, it's just another res like restriction that you need to work creatively within. So, um, with Look and with Reality Show, which were both, like you say, streamlined, you know, had to be very budget conscious, right? The, the subject matter lent itself creatively to a limited budget. Sure. You know, shooting something surveillance style enables us to move fast, to move cheaply, to have a small crew. It helped a lot. Um, you know, if I'm writing something, like I, I wrote this movie for, for Disney called Underdog. They had a jillion dollars to the, make the that CGI movie. CGI one, yeah, 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 I remember that. It it was not an issue. Writing, you know, oh, okay, this building blows up, and oh, the dog flies here, and the, this, uh, the all these dogs talk. I mean, that was just a non-issue. It was an A movie, summer movie. Budget was not a problem. You know, just be as creative as I wanted. Sky's the limit. On something like a reality show, budget is definitely an issue. But like, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do, say, a civil war epic shot with surveillance style shooting you know with gopros and i don't stuff know like that. that sounds kind of intriguing now that you mentioned <laughs> maybe like maybe we got an idea right there shit i think we're gonna you know what i'll cut you in you you you, you get 10 percent. You, you bring up an interesting point though with underdog and as someone who's a writer too um you talk about books that you want to see that's a challenge i'm very interested in because you know like there's the Evil Dead coming out, that's being a remake, you know, they're doing books to movies, comics to movies all the time. What is your sort of perception as a filmmaker trying to adapt those kind of things? I mean, I, I don't know if there's like, I, I was an underdog fan growing up. I was so, too. Like, I don't know if there's like underdog fans coming out of the woodwork being like, what the fuck, how are they going to do an there, underdog movie? <laughs> there but, were. <laughs> but like, what is your perception trying, in terms of trying to make an entertaining film, trying to honor the source material, trying to, you know, actually make this project happen instead of just being like, you can't make an underdog movie. It was short cartoons. What feature length? My, my responsibility is uh, first and foremost to, to, well, to myself creatively. I have to feel like I connect creatively to what I'm doing, you know? If I can't feel like I connect to it somehow, I can't do it. Even if it seems like, well, you know, like the most ridiculous thing, I, there's always a way for me to find some hook there that I can connect to. If I can't find that hook, I can't do it. And there's a lot of things I've turned down that I just can't, I can't figure out because I can't get excited about it. Something like Underdog, I grew up loving the show. I, uh, I knew that the movie couldn't be just a literal interpretation of the show. Sure. The show was, you know, it was a world where dogs and people sort of interacted all the time. And so the movie had to sort of be set in a real world. So that right. changed the dynamic. I just thought, okay, well, what if, what if I took the idea of um, a superhero movie, like an origin story, like Spider-Man, and just sort of lampooned this current crop of superhero origin story movies, and but instead of Peter Parker, it's a dog. And so that's, all right, okay, now it's fun. Now I can get my hooks around a way to handle it, you know? And so a lot of purists, underdog purists, did say, this is bullshit, man. You know, there's no sweet poly purebred the way I remember. You know, she used to, that dog should be a news reporter. And then, but other people are like, I love the show, but I see the new version Something of the movie, yeah. and my kid loved it, and I thought it was fun, and great, you know? Were you at all concerned, though, with, like, Rocky and Bowinkle? Like, when that came out, that got huge backlash. And even I will be like, this is kind of a yeah. weird fucking well, thing. Listen, with anything, you know, remakes, sequels, it's e there again, those are easy things to take pot shots at. But there are good remakes and there are bad remakes. There are good sequels, there are bad sequels, you know? I mean, the thing Oof, I don't think anyone would dispute that's an amazing remake. Yeah, John Carpenter's the thing. Phenomenal movie, remake of Howard Hawks original yeah, the uh, thing from the another thing world. from another world. It's a remake, great movie. The Fly. Yep. 
a remake, great movie. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of examples of that. And there's a lot of examples of horrible versions of it. It just feels like there are more remakes now, so like everything is exaggerated more. It's, it's, it, we're in a time, and it just, again, it is what it is. We're in a time where, because movies are more expensive than they've ever been, and releasing movies is more expensive than they've ever been, the marketing people at movie studios feel like if there's some awareness of a title that, that exists prior, it just gives us a little uh, bit more of a safety net. Battleship. Then, that's but that's how they think. You know, that's that's oh, no, you're that's, absolutely that's right. why they choose with what they choose. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just saying that's the mindset. So that's what we have to. Okay. So so the idea is okay. Here are the new rules. We have to work within these rules. You know, because because we can be upset, but it doesn't change it. So we just need to be creative within what the the current. <laughs> set of rules are. Does that make you sort of reevaluate the projects you look at? Do you like, you go like, look, 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 I got a Connect Four movie. It's going to be <laughs> fantastic. Listen, I've been in, I have been in meetings you, that you would not believe the things that they're trying to make movies out of. That you, I mean, I, I kid you not, pr like, I, I, uh, th there's a joke that um, Gore Verbinski, who is a friend and a fabulous director very, and very, very I'm very excited about Lone Ranger coming out he said you know because he's been in the, more of these meetings than anybody he said you know I just want to sit down with a uh, in a movie studio uh, uh, executive's office and put a box of Cheerios down and say you know how many sell every year Cheerios the movie pre-existing awareness let's make the movie Cheerios and he said they would just leap to doing it just because of the awareness of it there's no movie there but that's that's where we are you know yeah, I mean, I think that sort of gets into the other problem, though, of, like, when they start to manipulate these things based on something that, it, like, Battleship. Like, it was, it was so tangentially connected to, like, the show. It's like, there are battleships in it, I suppose, uh -huh. but, like, everything else is different. In fairness, I did not see Battleship, so I cannot comment on Battleship. It was, I think it was directed by a friend of mine, so I, and I always root for my friends to succeed, so I, I cannot comment on Battleship. I, I like Peter Berg all along good, but, like, I think he could be doing way more interesting films. He's a than very people. talented director. Very I, talented I, I, guy. The, the, movies he's seen that, the movies he's made that I've seen, I think, are great. So one of the other things I want to talk about is the actors. I mean, obviously, you've worked with some very big names, you know, Charlie Sheen, Christy Swanson, um, Ron Jeremy. <laughs> um, uh, you've worked with a lot of named people who acted for years. And I, 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 don't, I didn't recognize, really, anyone from the cast here. What is that sort of experience like? Was it? more interesting working with people who are sort of fresher or was it more challenging? It's, uh, you know, with, with reality show and with look prior, it was very important that we cast people who did not have recognizable faces. It would be hard to buy Charlie Sheen being yeah. a reality show or something. Exactly, because like you, you, you just you just recognize them. So you know you know it's not, he's not an accountant, that's Charlie Sheen. So, um, <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I, I specifically wanted to find new people. Um, and it's always challenging to find really good new people because uh, even though there are a lot of actors out there, there are very few of them that are great. And the ones that are often succeed very quickly and become very famous very fast. So we saw hundreds and hundreds of people for each role. And we got really, really lucky each time. Um, you know, it's easier to find um, undiscovered talent with young people, because they just haven't been discovered yet. So for the young, that, for yeah. the young, like the teenagers in the movie, sure. you know, we we saw some pretty pretty talented people. We I think we picked the best ones that we had uh, to choose from, and we picked people who I believe are going to be huge stars, great actors and actresses. Mm -hmm. But when you get into the the sort of the 40s and 50s year old range. You know, a lot of times if somebody hasn't made it by that age, there's a reason, right, you know? Yeah. So we saw a lot of people that were terrible, but the people that we did have the, the opportunity to cast are fantastic. Scott Anderson, who plays the dad, mm -hmm. has been a theater actor in Chicago for years. So he's got all this experience, but nobody uh, knows who he is on a national level. Interesting, you know? yeah. Kelly Hensley, who plays the mom, she actually was on a soap opera for 20 years. I, I wonder, she felt really not recognizable, and almost for a little while I was like, is that like Rachel Harris in there? Because uh, she sounded like Rachel Harris, she had sort of like... Kelly Hensley's her name, she was on a... Uh, hey, Brett, w Brett, what what soap was Kelly on? 
he, we think it's days of our lives. So we okay, could be wrong. We'll go with that. Okay. That's a believer. Uh, That's a as the world turns, could it be? Anyway, whatever. There's any number. Whatever of one it was. She was on for 20 years, but, and when she came in to read, we said, look, you're obviously the best actress for this role, but, and, but here's two problems. You have a fan base, so people will recognize you. And two, you look too hot. Yeah. You're nobody's going to believe you. Nobody's going to be, yeah, yeah, nobody's going to believe you're this, this mousy wife who's never had good sex, who's not sexually aware. She said, I'm an actress, please. I will, I will change my look. I will completely immerse myself in this role. And she did. And nobody recognized her. And yeah. she gave a fantastic performance. And she put a wig on and glasses and frumpy clothes. And, and she transformed into this mousy housewife. Now, for the scenes where she's naked, you can see she's got a slamming right, body. Yeah. She, she just looks great, right? <laughs> but I figure by that time in the movie, it's OK. Yeah. You know? One of the things that this obviously makes, it makes sense that there's a show based on it too. Have you ever thought about doing stuff like web series and stuff? I mean, obviously that's getting bigger budgets. I mean, now things like House of Cards are obviously sure. out there. But is that is that a medium that you've even thought about going to? Because it feels Absolutely. like you could do something like that, especially with something of this sort of... Um, streamlined level of production. Sure. I've absolutely thought about that. Listen, the, the, the exciting thing about today is that all the rules have changed. The, the, all bets are off, you know? Movies, TV shows, short form TV shows, short content, uh, webisodes, the phone content, it's all available. And it, the, the, it's just, just as creative as you can be is the restriction that you have, uh, uh, you, you have to work within. So I'm, I'm for all of it. I think all of it is exciting, and I want to work in all those forms. Do you prefer working more sort of in an independent medium so that you have more of the creative control? Because, I, I mean, I can't speak for, like, The Chase and Detroit Rock City. I love both those films, but I would imagine they probably would, the studios would be very much involved with those kind of things, sort of giving you notes. And um, it like. depends. You know, I, I generally prefer to as a filmmaker, as a writer-director, make films that I have more creative control over. And so usually the less of a budget you have, the more control you're given, just because it's less risk right, yeah. for the company giving you the money. Um, that said, I've had some fabulously creatively fulfilling experiences being involved in some very big movies, you know? I mean, I, uh, I wrote a movie called Mouse Hunt, um, for DreamWorks. Was that the Nathan Lane? Yeah, yeah. yeah I Total that. creative, ex uh, fantastic creative experience. Small Soldiers was also DreamWorks. Another fantastically yeah, right. creative experience. You know, I've also had experiences where there's so many cooks in the kitchen that it just makes you want to tear your hair out. But you know what? That's just, that's nature that. The that's the nature of the business. Yeah. That's the fun about a movie, though, is every movie is a different adventure. Every movie is a different group of people. Every movie is a different uh, experience. And so... Sometimes you're going to get a lot of cooks. Sometimes you're going to get total freedom. It's all it's all fun. I feel like you're speaking from somebody who's been in Hollywood for like I don't know 20 or 30 years. <laughs> that sounds about right. We've been dicked over enough times. <laughs> no, just, it is what it is. Like and accept it. But you know what? It's 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 easy for people, and I've seen a lot of people get this way. It's easy for people to get angry and bitter over the way it is. But I think that just slows you down. I think what you need to do is see every single obstacle as a creative challenge. And if that, if you, you know, it's like Mary Poppins, you know, with every, uh, with every, I don't, what, how does it go? With every job, uh, there is, uh, needs yeah. to be done, there is an element of fun. Find yeah. the fun, Make and the job's a game. So it's the same thing with Hollywood. That's pretty good. All right, so uh, let's wrap this up. Um, reality show, what's the plan for distribution? When can people see it? All that sort of fun stuff. Well, here's the thing. We made it independently. We're here at the festival um, showing it to critics and buyers and audiences, and hopefully we'll drum up some attention, do the film festival circuit for a while, You know, make a nice uh, deal with a, a distributor. We'd love to take it out in sort of a platform release. It's obviously a specialty film. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, especially that second half. People, people are either going to probably love or hate that. I can imagine. Yeah, so I, I, I don't see it as a three thousand theater release, you know, in malls across the country kind of movie. So the plan is, you know, do the festival circuit, find a distributor who gets it, 
and take it out as a platform release, get some attention for it, and then you know hopefully it takes a life it takes on a life of its own. And the series is or was the series on Showtime was on Showtime, and if it's not still on demand on Showtime on demand, it will be available in other forms soon. Uh, is there a website or anything for the movie version? RealityShowTheFilm.com. Uh, and in terms of you, uh, I know you have a Twitter. Just Adam. A at Adam Rifkin. All right. Is there anywhere else you will have people be able to follow? I'm easy. What's going I'm on? easy to. Uh, I'm easy to find on Facebook. You know, I'm. E I'm at my friend limit, but everything that I post, everybody can see. So feel free. You know. Awesome. Um, well, I wish you the best of luck getting reality show out there, and I can't wait to see what you do next. I appreciate it, man. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And uh, check out more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to buy the science style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.